appreciate uh, first the invitation to be able to come and uh, give uh, these series of lectures uh, for you guys. Uh, I understand it's a lot, uh, 15 hours in five days, that's uh, plus times two. You guys are you know, work, work really hard. So in that spirit, one thing I want to say is uh, about these lectures or about the material get is there's not the expectation that you're going to take all the material that's in four or five hundred slides, suck it in all today, process it, and be proficient in this tomorrow. What I really hope this is is more a reference for you as, as you're working through your graduate career and your professional career is that mainly within just the near term, the next year or two years, you can say, okay, I remember this vague idea and you can go back and look through the notes, and then even when the notes aren't clear, then you just send me an email. That's, that's the best way I, that I, I hope this, this works for you, because there's no way that we can, we can comprehensively cover everything, even in 15 hours, okay? And so there's obviously topics that are left out. There may be topics that you were hoping for or expecting that are left out, but hopefully I've tried to hit uh, kind of the theory and principles behind sort of the major techniques. And it's the last part of the title that's really important. It's the turbulent combustion part, okay? Oh, go ahead. And so really, that's why I'm not comprehensively covering every possible diagnostic there is. It's ones that are primarily used that can be used for single shot imaging, instantaneous realizations, okay? And we'll talk about this when we start talking about, uh, start talking about this will work out. I think this is what we practiced with yesterday. Believe it or not, we come here a day before, we set everything up, make sure it works, and then we forget to hit all the right buttons on the first day. So. But anyway, this should work out. So anyway, that, that's kind of a, what I hope that you get out of this, is that it's really for the practitioner. It's for you to apply, okay? And you'll see there's a tremendous amount of theory behind these diagnostics that we'll go over. You'll get 250 equations. It looks ridiculous, we'll do a lot of derivations, but it's really to give you kind of the background of when you go and use a diagnostic, you don't use it blindly, that you know the limitations, you know the error bounds, you know the uncertainty, and that you can be confident with your measurements, okay? That's really what we want. There's too many times that I think a lot of these measurements are just used blindly, and, and, and the results are very difficult to interpret in that case. So hopefully after this, You'll be in the top 10% in the world for understanding the ins and outs of uh, some of these techniques and their application. Okay, so again, if you guys want to, curiosity, don't do it now, don't get your phones out now, but if you want to at some point want to look at what my group does, this is our web page. As you can imagine, everything is up to date except for the actual research itself. And so uh, we, that's always the last thing. We update, we put a tons of content, and then it's outdated. <laughs> A bit. So, but anyway, go through, go visit websites, uh, see what we're doing, and again, my contact information is is on there. Okay, and so really, this kind of graphical schematic kind of goes over a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, what we'll be talking about this week is generally we're going to hit the laser diagnostics from various viewpoints, from the optical side, uh, from the diagnostic side, and then the interpretation side as well. All right, so what is, we're in lecture one, day one, okay? And so what is the goal of lecture one? We want to set the stage for the remaining diagnostic, I mean, for the remaining lectures. Hopefully, I'll be able to give you a bit of motivation. Very short, you're having, you've had, either had combustion class or you've had combustion in the morning. Oh, laser pointer. All right, so I don't have to use my finger. Thank you. Does this need to, this needs to go in? Perfect. Okay. So we'll go over motivation, why we want to do combustion. First of all, as a, as a hands, in this class, how many of you are experimental? I should say, how many of you are not experimentalists? Anybody taking the class that's a computation? Outstanding. I'm going to look at you and talk to you the entire time. I'll talk to you this entire week. Okay. Okay. How many of you, though, are experimentalists and do not use laser diagnostics? I mean, you just thought it was going to be interesting, but you're more... Uh, Okay, that's good. So we, now the rest of you have no reason to actually be in this class because you already use them, you already know everything there is. So you all just, you know, stay quiet and correct me only in the breaks, okay? Okay, so hopefully we'll give this why we want to use these diagnostics. 
What we'll start talking about in this lecture is an interaction of light and matter, really the basics for combustion scientists. Again, this is not going to be from a chemical physics point of view. It's not going to go down the rabbit hole of like a hardcore physics. Uh, very, uh, the amount of times you'll see quantum mechanics will be very, very light. But it's really the basics and foundation that you need uh, to understand a lot of these diagnostics. Okay? Uh, again, in this lecture, just an overview of what I call popular and useful is actually just really the tried and true laser diagnostic approaches okay? and general challenges from a measurement point of view. And so, again, one of the themes that you'll see through a lot of these lectures is I will take at times even a negative approach on some of these diagnostics, where their flaws are, where their warts are, okay? What, what is wrong with them? And what do we need to understand? How do we bound a measurement, okay? And so again, what we're going to see is that we have a great challenge in turbulent combustion is the fact that, and I'll get into this throughout the lecture, is that we're trying to, uh, from a very complex system that's combining turbulence and chemistry, we have a whole range of length scale species, everything that's happening, and we make a very sparse, I mean, the kind of the sparsest data set you can imagine. We usually make one or two measurements and we attempt to understand what's happening. So there's a, there's a pretty massive challenge. And so, uh, and again, even when we make a measurement, are we actually resolving everything? When we don't resolve things, what, what are the implications for that? So we'll talk a little bit about that, okay? okay so we'll start a little bit in our, our, our motivation. Again, I'm only going to have one or two slides because you, you get this in, in a lot of, your, lot of your courses and even here early in the morning. Uh, this is 2018 uh, energy consumption uh, chart. Uh, it's in, in quads. The nice thing is it's uh, 101 quads, which is very close to 100. So almost you can just add these things up and the total uh, summation is essentially the percentage. But really what you want to point out on this is of the uh, energy consumption uh, in the United States in 2018, about 85% came from combustion, okay? And, and thrown in there is biomass, okay? And that's not unexpected. We've been touting for a long time, 80 to 85% of the energy usage comes from, from combustion. That's usually the first line we write in kind of our proposals, right? That's how we kind of we put the, the hook in. But what's a little uh, interesting is that if you go and look at the amount that actually goes through energy serv uh, services versus the rejected energy, things that may go as waste, heat, et cetera, about 68% of it is rejected, okay? So there's a clear, uh, there's reasons for this. Again, that's not the uh, topic of, of, of these talks, but it really shows that there's an opportunity for us to make improvements, efficiency, utilization, uh, et cetera. And so really what this can kind of be kind of the underlying or the overarching theme is, is there's still work to be done, a significant amount of work to be done in combustion science, and we need to develop certain tools uh, to examine these processes, okay? Now, when we get into kind of what our challenge is, this is, kind of characterizes a lot of what we're dealing with. I'll show you later when we're looking at kind of time scales on, on these things is that each one of these full cycles is occurring slightly faster in the blink of the eye. I've timed that out. And we're really trying to characterize the physics, the structure, the chemistry, if you will, the fluid mechanics that's happening on things that are occurring, uh, you know, in, in very short time scales, microseconds to milliseconds, okay? And so I'm not going to talk, we're not really looking at the physics here other than that they made very interesting movies, but really the point is, is that we have quite a challenge in understanding. Here's a simple four-stroke engine, you know, we have intake, uh, injection, the power stroke, and the exhaust, and we're attempting to, one, understand the fundamental physics in these processes, and to understand them at a point to where we can develop computational models that can, not, that can predict this and ultimately used in design. Okay, so that's kind of, you know this, you've been in combustion classes, you know kind of the motivation, but sometimes it just takes a, taking a step back and looking at something like this. This right here is a, is a, is a single uh, four-stroke four cycle, and you can just see it's gonna, it has a massive amount of information that's even contained even in these visual images that we attempt to understand. And now we want to zoom down to the smallest scales, the smallest length scales, the smallest time scales with our diagnostic approaches and hope to glean actually some pretty useful information from this, okay? So again, 
the questions that you should be asking yourself of taking this course here in the summer school is how, how do lasers and photons, if you will, help with the energy problem? How do lasers and photons help us understand engines? And ultimately, how can we improve these engines, okay? Why has the community, from a measurement point of view, shifted to laser diagnostics? Why is there a continued emphasis on the development, okay? And, you know, why, why do we uh, take the effort to make these extremely complicated systems, these, these very expensive systems, and to hopefully get a single measurement? These are the type of questions that maybe you should ask yourselves. They generate very nice images or very nice results, but hopefully it's a little bit more, more than that. Okay. okay, so in laser diagnostics, what I'll contend, which I hope many of you would too, are laser-based measurements are an important tool for studying combustion processes in detail. So let's try to pick this apart a little bit. Again, we're in lecture one. We're trying to build the foundation of why, why you would want to make measurements other than maybe your advisor says, okay, I have a laser sitting in the corner. Go make a PLIF measurement. Or, you know. But let's, let's say why, why would we want to do this in the first place. Well, you have a tremendous amount of selectivity. Okay? You can pick from various techniques to measure quantity of interest. There's techniques for species, temperature, pressure, velocity, and even particle characteristics. Okay. Uh, they're typically non-intrusive. Well, this will be a theme we talk about. Uh, they're not always non-intrusive. Photons, in, in general, do not interfere with fluid mechanics. This is extremely important for turbulent flows. Okay? Uh, and we don't interfere with chemistry. Unlike a physical probe, as you can imagine, there's a whole host of chemical processes that can come. But just it's very, uh, very simple to visualize the fact that I put a probe in a flow field, the streamlines have to diverge, they go around the, flow, the probe, et cetera, okay? So laser diagnostics are non-intrusive. In general, you can get pretty good spatial resolution. Laser beams can be focused to small probe volumes, typically limited by diffraction. We do much worse than that. We'll talk about that in the third lecture here that's on, on resolution, okay? Uh, sensitivity. Uh, for many measurements, you can measure minor species down certainly to parts to mi per million and even down to parts per billion. Okay, so they're, they're quite sensitive. And again, survivability. It's hard to melt a photon uh, under high temperature conditions, but certainly thermocouples and probes may not handle the most extreme conditions. And again, this is kind of an interesting one. For a lot of the diagnostics, there's a direct interaction with, with light and matter. And what that means is the signal you get is proportional to your quantity of interest, whether it's number density, okay, whether it's, you know, whatever else it'll be. I'll just stop with number density before we go, go to other, other types of measurements. But many times in probes, that, that's not the case. You're actually looking at an indirect interaction. You're looking at either heat conduction to infer something. You're looking at a, uh, a, a chemical reaction to infer something, okay? And so lots of times we have direct interaction. Okay. Now, when do we not make laser diagnostics? This is just as important. Number one, if you do not need to, okay? And let, let's explain this. Uh, I'll explain this, okay? One, we always have to make concessions for optical diagnostics. Real, window, real engines don't have windows, okay? So we're already changing even heat transfer characteristics if we try to make uh, optical, optical access, okay? The environment may not be what I call friendly. So, the majority of laser diagnostics and turbulent combustion research are in these beautiful, unconfined blue flames. We make them soot-free, right? So, but real environments where we're interested may have windows, soot, uh, particulate. They may interfere with really good laboratory diagnostics. It's the number of diagnostics that we can do in, in, in soot-free, what we used to call permanently blue flames, uh, open access. We can make exceptional measurements. Then as you start to go into actual pressure, confinement, uh, real fuels, uh, they end up, uh, can be quite a challenge. Thing went dead. All right, so qualitative versus quantitative. This is another one that we'll talk about, especially in the context of PLIF. Laser-induced fluorescence is a very common technique that many of you may have already used for visualization, and that's usually where it stops, okay? trying to get quantitative information. We'll talk about this in Rayleigh scattering when you get a signal that is species dependent but you don't have the species, okay? How do we interpret the measured signals, okay? They can be quantitative with a lot of work, okay? But in general, a lot of our diagnostics are just qualitative measurements, okay? Expensive. 
Laser and a camera, maybe about 100000 a thermocouple, maybe $20. So why, why do we go through this uh, uh, trouble? Okay, time consuming as well, expensive in time. It may take you six months to get a certain system online. It may not take you six months to get a thermocouple online. Okay? Complexity, they can have large footprints. Again, system alignment, repeatability, sensitivity of surroundings. Many of uh, a few years ago when femtosecond laser diagnostics were coming online, People would have to keep their labs humidity controlled to a fraction of a percent. Vibrations in the room would cause the systems to go out of alignment, okay? And this is an exceedingly frustrating. At the bare minimum, when we take measurements, my students realign the entire, and you guys do too, realign the entire optical system daily. And the more elements you put in there, as you get into 20s to 30s to 40s pieces of di uh, optical piece, you have to align these every day. So they're, they're kind of a, a pain. Okay, so they're complex, so when you don't need that, I, they, they, they come with quite a bit of overhead in terms of time. Okay? So we want to keep that in mind of, of when and when not to use them as well. Well, what, what's the role of laser diagnostics? We'll move on to that and start sort of branching out. Okay? One of the primary reasons of using laser diagnostics is to understand the fundamentals of reactive flows. Okay? These, again, can come in... The concept of you're in laboratory flames, you're trying to understand the fundamental physics, you're trying to understand a singular unit problem of a more complex system, okay? This is where, again, in my laboratory, we spend a lot of time, we're trying to understand so-called turbulence chemistry interaction. We're trying to understand how the turbulence couples to the reaction zones, how it influences mixing, how does this in, uh, end up influence species formation and destruction. So we're trying to really understand the fundamentals. Okay? A second role that, that is really, as, as Professor Law was talking about, in the same time, uh, computational models in the context of turbulent combustion uh, have been, been developed and are currently being developed again. And so in, in the context that you can't directly simulate everything through direct numerical simulation, there's models, large eddy simulation, uh, RANS type models, and in order to assess the actual models that are in this simulation, we need data. We need measurements. We need data that we're confident about. And so a role of laser diagnostics is to provide high fidelity data for assessing models, okay? Uh, you can move on to characterizing ground test facilities, okay? As we start to move into maybe the larger scale now, you can see we're gonna have a systematic shift as you start moving up the food chain, if you will, before you're getting to things that are flight demos or to things that are more, uh, if you want to call it, uh, kind of final hardware ready, you'll end up moving from laboratory scale to more realistic systems. Um, but before you would ever want to fly them, you would want to characterize their capabilities uh, in still a reasonably well-controlled environment. Okay? Another role of diagnostics in the laboratory are to assess and develop new technology, new burner platforms, new ways of controlling certain chemical processes. Uh, again, if you have well-controlled measurement techniques, uh, they're very useful. And then, of course, they can be deployed into the field. Uh, so Absorption-type measurements, extinction-type measurements can be put into not a remote sensing in a type of control environment, okay? And so we can go anywhere. We could talk about any one of these, you know, for, for hours on what their particular pros and cons are, but this is just to give you an idea of where you can find these measurement approaches within uh, the field. Okay. Now let's kind of look at a family tree, if you will. Again, when we say combustion diagnostics, what are we really talking about? We can have optical diagnostics, which many of you, I think, associate, and then the title of the lectures are laser diagnostics, but just to kind of back up, Combustion, just, combustion diagnostics just means that we're going to make measurements in a combustion system. So they could be physical, but they can also be optical. Then within optical diagnostics, you can have laser-based or non-laser-based. As you can imagine, non-laser-based <coughs> me, non -laser -based would be things like Schlieren, Shattergraph, chemiluminescence. Okay, still optical properties, uh, but we're not, not using a laser to excite uh, the process of interest. Then the process can be what we can term spectroscopic or non-spectroscopic. Okay, spectroscopic uh, processes would be that actually take advantage of a, uh, again, the field of spectroscopy to interpret uh, the results. That means we're using something about the fundamental structure of the molecule and its inherent energy 
uh, the, the energy contained within a molecule. And we'll go on that. We have an entire couple of lectures on spectroscopy. So we'll go into actually what spectroscopy means and when and, and why do we use it. But we have certain ones that, again, they're basically we, they're non-spectroscopic tools. PIV, which we'll spend three lectures talking about because it is the mainstay of getting the fluid mechanics uh, in, a, in a turbulent combustion environment. But it's a non-spectroscopic process. Uh, laser LDV, uh, holography, all of these are non-spectroscopic. But within these lectures, we will talk about all the uh, hidden details within these techniques as well. So we'll have kind of a flavor of both throughout these lectures. Okay. All right, so what can uh, diagnostics be? Uh, how, do we, how do we characterize these? Okay, that's kind of an important uh, way to think about these. Okay, they can be resonant or non-resonant. Okay, and this will be important. Really, a, a very lay way to think about this is, do you have to tune a laser to a specific wavelength? Okay? Can the measurement be done with anything you have laying around the lab, or do you have to have a particular wavelength? The reason is, you're actually, if you have to tune to a specific wavelength, that's you're trying to find a resonance of the molecule. That may be an electronic, uh, rotational, vibrational transition. We'll talk about this, but you're having to tune to something that's specific about the energy characteristics of the species of interest, okay? And so that just can't happen anywhere, and we're going to talk about where these come from, okay? Why certain molecules have the excitation transitions they do, okay? Now, but non-resonant techniques, you don't have to. Again, an example, scattering processes. We can use any wavelength we want to and still look at the same phenomena. Okay? They can be... Uh, line of sight. So how many of you uh, use chemiluminescence as just a, a, a kind of a first order type diagnostic? Chemiluminescence, there's no laser, right? But the information you get is integrated throughout the entire depth of field of the camera. It's that, so that's line of sight. How many of you use absorption techniques? Anybody use absorption? See, there we go. So that's from a laser diagnostic. That is a path integrated measurement as well you get the entire path integrated absorption, okay? So these line of sight techniques, uh, we can have single point, that's exactly what it is, it's a zero degree measurement. There's nothing technically a single point, but we're integrating over a very small volume in, in space. Line measurements, uh, 1D measurements, where you look at maybe a radial or transverse profile. The more common in turbulent combustion is planar, where we're looking at a quote unquote image. Volumetric, now gives us three-dimensional, and then the wonderful 4D measurement, which is volumetric and time resolved, okay? And we'll talk about these. They all come with exceeding levels of complexity. Linear versus nonlinear techniques, really very simple. Is the signal you're measuring, is it linear with input laser intensity? And again, we'll talk about uh, various linear and nonlinear techniques throughout the lectures. Lasers that you'll use, they can be continuous wavelength. Those are uh, just ones that are on. Think about Heaney laser. Uh, they can be what we would characterize now as long pulse. And believe it or not, we're now at a point to where a nanosecond pulse is considered a long pulse type laser. But then we have uh, short pulse, femtosecond to picosecond. And the reason why short pulse diagnostics have really come on, it's not the fact that fluid mechanics are moving there's no difference from a fluid's point of view between nanosecond and a femtosecond. But what, when you get into these femtosecond lasers, you actually have the pulses that are shorter than actually uh, molecular action, chemical action. So you can actually, you're, you're, you're having the pulses shorter than any kind of collisional dynamics. And these, these laser diagnostics ends up, end up being uh, essentially collision free. And, and when we get into laser induced fluorescence, we'll, we'll talk about the significance of uh, collisions and then collisional quenching and what it does to your signal and how you have to be able to interpret that. Uh, lasers can be spectrally narrow. We would consider that more like a monochromatic uh, source or they can be broadband and spectral bandwidth. Uh, they can range from the infrared through the ultraviolet. Okay. Make sure. Yep. Okay. Now, what do we want to measure when we move into a turbulent combustion environment? Again, we're just trying to set the stage for all of these measurements. What are the quantities of interest? First of all, 
when we have turbulent combustion, we have to start with the flow field, okay? We always are characterizing essentially two things. We have the flow field, we have the scalar fields. Scalars being species, temperature, we'll talk about this. But in the flow field, what we start out at a, at a lowest level, kind of the first level of kind of characterization are the first couple of statistical moments. We have mean velocities, RMS fluctuations, rental stresses, okay? These are kind of lower order statistics. Uh, we may be interested in gradients, may be interested in strain rate, vorticity, dilatation, okay? We may be interested in these quantities. Uh, integral scales, spectra, okay? All these different types of phenomenon. In scalar fields, again, the exact same thing, statistics, but now we're, we're, we become interested in topology from imaging, the structure of flames, uh, the curvature, where we have flame extinction, et cetera. These are type of things that you can get from these type of measurements. Gradients and dissipation rates. With any measurement, uh, you want to get well-defined boundary conditions for both. And then there may be other areas that you're interested in, acoustics, unsteadiness, et cetera. Okay? So there's a lot of responsibility that comes with making good measurements and characterizing uh, turbulent flames. This is not exhaustive, but here's some suggestive reading if you don't already own these. Uh, again, my favorites, there shouldn't be anyone who uses diagnostic that doesn't have ek breath sitting in their, their cabinet, okay? This is a very nice book uh, from uh, Kateri Jose Hoenghaus and Jay Jeffries. Uh, laser book, it, this is a great laser book, uh, Silk Fast, if you guys are looking for a good, uh, good book. Well, everyone up here, Mark Lenny, Spectroscopic Measurements, a really good book. Ron Hansen's book's good. Adrian's uh, PIV book. These are great. These are resources. These aren't exhaustive. These are just saying, okay, if I want something sitting on my shelf, that I can go and look up something in a couple minutes. These are a great place to start. And then, of course, any number of review articles uh, that have come out in the past uh, decade or so. Okay. All right, let's try to move a little bit into the instrumentation. This is usually an area that's not discussed a lot when we're talking about diagnostic approaches. But your instrumentation, it turns out, is a significant part of the quality of your measurement, okay? And I'm not just talking about the laser end. Well, let's talk about the, we'll talk, the detector end determines, uh, for, especially for single shot measurements, it really gives you the quality in terms of signal noise. Okay, so I can't draw a schematic that covers every possible. Each one of you will have a different uh, schematic in your lab, okay? But so I've decided to use the most advanced CAD programs there are and generate this model of a laser that fires a UV beam, then a visible beam, then a near IR beam, okay? Now, then we're going to focus it through a test section, and then we're going to collect it. Okay, so clearly this is a comical little cartoon, and again, this only comprises a very small fraction. But I use this to show you all the different elements that can exist within a measurement. You have your light source, you have optics. The light source has certain characteristics that determine how you can focus it, the quality of your measurement. The optics have their own type of resolution. How you collect the light determines the fraction of the light, okay? It determines a lot of your signal. Filters determine whether or not you have interference, okay? Your detector. Uh, may be intensified, non-intensified. It's going to carry a tremendous amount of noise, or may it, it may not, okay? So here in these notes, the lasers and detectors all take many forms, each of them with their own characteristics. We'll talk about a couple of them in, over the next couple slides. And hopefully it'll maybe answer some of the questions you've had about your instrumentation. If not, you're always uh, free to ask. Okay, so let's talk about lasers, okay? And it's not going to be this one, because we want them typically non-intrusive, but you know. So I'm lucky we've hit a sweet spot through the re-emergence of Star Wars. About 10, 15 years ago, this may have gone on death, but you know, you guys have gone back and watched all the old Star Wars, right? So, but the, the good ones, so. <laughs> all right, so we'll go back. So let's talk a little bit about lasers, and we're, we really, we don't generate any Death Stars or anything like this. Okay, so we're not gonna talk about Lasers, I'm not going to give you energy levels and show you how a laser works and all of that, though if you're interested, just talk to me at the break and we talk about some interesting lasers. But 
typically what we'll use them for, we'll call them, I'll call them quasi-monochromatic. I'll, I'll talk about later when we get into kind of light matter in action. There's no such thing as monochromatic. You can't have monochromatic light uh, uncertainty. Heisenberg tells you that. But uh, here we have quasi-monochromatic, meaning that we have a very narrow bandwidth uh, compared to white light. So these aren't white light sources in general, although there are white light techniques. They're coherent, they're directional, meaning that they take up and they are a beam, okay, versus having a flashlight, okay. So that's typically what a laser looks like. Again, they can be tunable. CW pulse, we went over this a bit, but again, it's kind of always interesting. Look, they can range anywhere from 10 to the 18th to 10 to the minus 6 seconds, okay? Uh, low and high average power, high pulse energies, high instantaneous power. Whatever you want, you can find a flavor, okay? And it really depends on your application. Continuous wavelength lasers. These would be the things you would use more in absorption type measurements. We don't use a whole lot in turbulent combustion research, but you may have uh, Gini argon ion tunable diode lasers, okay? Pulse lasers, the most common used are the, there we go, YAG laser, XMER laser, okay? When we say a pulse laser, again, just so we understand we're on the same page, this is where the light comes out in a very short duration uh, compared to the fluid mechanics time scales, okay? And then there's many times where we have to take that fundamental light that's coming out of laser and we, we need to move it somewhere. We need to change it. We need to change the color. We need to change the frequency, okay? That's typically in a spectroscopic measurement where we need to overlap the laser with some allowed transition of molecule. And then those typically come in the form of the dye laser or in more of a solid state, an optical parametric oscillator. So the keys about these is they're broadly tunable. They allow you a whole host of wavelength extent. Uh, extensions. So typically your normal setting you'll see is that there's a dye laser that's pumped by a YAG that gives you something that's shifted that you can tune in the visible regime and then you can do certain harmonics frequency, double it, triple it to get anywhere in the UV you want. You can also take all these same pulses, do things that are like frequency mix, go to the IR. You can go anywhere you want to with solid state crystals. Okay? There's not really a regime that's within region that we can't reach. Now, may not be efficient, but we can reach it. All right, let's talk a little bit about your detectors. This is what I found, what I found with uh, most of my students is that this is the area that when they're finishing up or when they're, I don't say when they're in the midst of data taking, this is the part that they've paid probably the least amount of attention to, right? Because you, you have a certain camera sitting in the, in the cabinet or this is what the previous student used, et cetera. You, have a, you may not know the details and you may not know how it's actually influencing uh, your, your measurement, okay? And especially in combustion research, it almost seems like the de facto piece of equipment is an intensified CCD camera, right? And it's very few applications where that's actually even needed. And so I'll, I'll try to talk about that a little bit. Well, let's talk about with the base CCD camera, okay? So uh, we don't have to go into all of the theory behind the camera, but essentially you have incident photons, you've had some process, your laser has come in, generated some sort of scattering, some sort of fluorescence, photons have been, have been emitted, you collect them with a collection lens, right, and then they're sent to uh, your CCD. Well, what you have at CCD is the silicone-based uh, product, if you will, and part of the sensor is silicone-based, and as the photons hit the silicone, they end up ejecting an electron hole uh, pair, right? And so what you do is you have essentially a version of the photoelectric effect, and again, you, these photoelectrons migrate a, a, to a potential well, the CD, CD. So photons come in, photoelectrons are generated, okay? And then essentially, the, the guts of a CCD is it's a capacitor. And so when these photoelectrons go to this capacitor, it stores charge, okay? And then charge is proportional to photons. This is what's nice about a CCD. If we just kind of take all the text and condense it, you're, you have instant photons and you have the charge that you measure, okay? But then the charge is read out through an A to D converter, okay? And so the signal you get is proportional to the number of photons. So they're typically, in general, they're very linear, okay? okay? And they have this very nice character. They don't have uh, gain factors, okay? So, what do we, else do we know about CCDs? Well, the pixels are typically reasonably small, uh, maybe sub 10 microns, 
you certainly rays are now getting huge. There's certainly more than a megapixel, and maybe 10 megapixels. The utility of, of these is that you yield images. This is what we really want kind of at the lowest level. We can see structure, okay? And again, here's kind of the key. They're very linear and uniform, low noise. We'll talk about noise sources in these lectures. The noise is really only coming from shot noise and from read noise, okay? And both of these can be controlled very well on modern CCDs. And they exhibit a very high dynamic range, okay? And dynamic range will define as just your kind of the range between the highest and your noise floor, okay? So CCDs are kind of scientific CCDs are really what you want to use uh, when you can, okay? And again, I'll talk throughout the diagnostics on many of these. We can actually use CCDs where historically intensified cameras have been used. Well, what do I mean by an intensified camera? Well, uh, they may be an add-on that you lens couple, or it may just be all one camera that's fiber optically coupled, but it's really it's a CD, CD with a giant, really a photo multiplier tube attached to the front, or a photocathode, really. It's a, and so it's an intensifier. And so really what you have here is you just have a separate process that's happening before. So now, let's say you have a process that the signal is just too low that the CCD uh, can't image, or the really the most useful point of an ICCD is the very short gate time. Okay, that's really the only place where in, in a lot of combustion research you really need this because you can gate it, and I'll talk about that in just one second. We can have really short shutter time. Okay, so what happens is you have, you have input light, so you have the same phenomenon I just described. Photons are emitted from your process. They're coming, they're coming at your optic. You collect your optics and you send it to your uh, ICCD. Really what happens is they hit a photocathode, okay? So this photocathode is usually biased to a high negative voltage, okay? And what the photocathode does is does the same thing, photoelectric effect. So each photon that comes in, it generates photo, photoelectrons. Similar, same thing I just said about a CCD. So we haven't really done anything right now. But then what they're done is they're accelerated uh, to this, what's called a multi-channel plate. And as it goes to the multi-channel plate, you end up, you can think of them as layers. I used to have this nice uh, figure is that you can have these layers and as the photon sort of bounces through them, each photon is essentially, you're, you're essentially creating faux photons, if you will, each one's coming off, okay? And so you multiply the photoelectrons, okay? So each photon comes out, you may generate tens to hundreds of thousands of additional photoelectrons for every incident photoelectron, okay? So now you've, you've done, you've generated all these extra photoelectrons. Then what they're sent is to a phosphor screen. So the phosphor screen absorbs these photoelectrons and then emits light again through phosphorescence, okay? And so they're now back to photons. We have another, but then now we have our CCD sitting back here and then the photons go right back through the same process we just talked about, okay? They're converted photoelectrons again, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So one of the things that, we should realize for the, what the ICCD is doing is it, it intensifies your signal, meaning that you're multiplying every incident photon. That's what the gain is referred to. So that's really great, but the part about this is there has to be a tremendous amount of uncertainty in this multiplication process. You can't send one in and say, I want exactly 10 out every time. You may get 10 plus or minus 10, okay? And therefore you end up with additional amount of noise. Now I'm obviously uh, exaggerating when I say 10 plus or minus 10, but you end up with actually amplifier noise. And every time the, the photo, every time a photoelectron is multiplied, the, it's plus or minus how many you're going to get out. But then those new photoelectrons are also amplified on the next pass, and they have some statistical uncertainty, and you keep this uh, going, uh, going along. That is why when you look at an ICCD image, it looks grainy. Okay, some pixels get more photoelectrons than the other one. And so you have this kind of salt and pepper looking image. So you end up adding a lot of noise, okay? But the main power is this. You can actually turn this uh, multi-channel plate, the MCP, on and off very quick. You can bias the voltage uh, off and on very quickly. And therefore you can end up with a gate as low as a few nanoseconds, even hundreds of picoseconds. That is where the ICCD has its power in very luminous flow fields, okay, maybe, maybe sooting type fields. And the other thing that the ICC really allows you to do is move into the UV range because what happens is uh, many CCDs are not UV sensitive, okay, but what happens is the photocathode is, can be made UV sensitive 
they're multiplied, and then the phosphor screen accepts these kind of UV, these, sorry, the phosphor, the photocathode UV, it generates photoelectrons, and now the wavelength is gone. Uh, the phosphor screen emits in the visible, and then the CCD can collect the visible, okay? Okay, the last one we'll talk about that's, uh, is the CMOS camera. Uh, it's an alternative CCD camera. Really, in the context of our research, it allows us to go fast. Each individual pixel has its own A to B, A to D converter, amplifier noise correction, et cetera. So instead of taking like a CCD where you do kind of a bucket brigade and read out or you shift charge and then read out, each one of these things read out individually. So instead of reading out at tens, uh, tens of hertz, it can read out at 10, 20, hundreds of kilohertz, okay? In general, they have a bit higher noise, lower uniformity, because each one's its own active pixel, lower dynamic range. So in general, this is not referring to, some of you may be familiar with something called an SCMOS. That's a different technology that I'm not going to talk to. That's actually better than a CCD, but we're kind of referring to the traditional CMOS technology. Okay, and then we're going to finish up this lecture by just giving you an introduction to all the different types of uh, diagnostics that we're going to talk about through the remaining lectures, okay? So what we're going to do is give you kind of interaction of light and matter. What happens when lasers and uh, gas molecules meet? Uh, what we can, photons can be destroyed, they can be created, they can be rerouted. What I mean by that is we can have energy that is lost or gained. And this will be the manifestation of certain scattering process. We can reroute. What I mean by rerouting, that's kind of my way of saying we can have absorption plus re-emission, which is a fluorescence technique, okay? So really, if we have a gas and we tune our laser to the appropriate wavelength, we can absorb, we can absorb the gas, I mean absorb the photons. We, after we absorb those, we can re-emit those photons. That can be in fluorescence and phosphorescence. We can scatter it, and that can be elastic, which means there's no net energy gain or loss, okay? We'll spend a lot of time talking about Rayleigh scattering and Raman scattering. But if there is an energy exchange, that's what's referred to as inelastic scattering, and that's Raman scattering, okay? And then if you have particulate, you can actually make them hot, okay? And they can incandesce, okay? And this is the basis behind laser-induced incandescence. Okay, so let's give a brief overview. So here is kind of my statements. Um, I'll go over some of the more useful and common laser diagnostic techniques. I cannot present them all. And again, one thing I want to say is that throughout the lectures, when we talk about an individual diagnostic, we're going to talk about all the specifics, the equipment analysis. And so you don't worry if there's something that looks like I just briefly gloss over here. We will come back to these, okay? And we'll talk about, like I said, in a much more depth. If there's something you don't understand, whether it's even from this introductory, but mainly in, the, uh, in the, uh, the main primary lectures throughout the week, ask me a question. Certainly, I have no problem trying to answer them. I'll tell you if I don't know. Uh, uh, we'll go off and think about it and come back with hopefully a reasonable, reasonable answer. Okay. okay. Oh, the last point I want to kind of emphasize. Uh, as I mentioned, as I started this speaking, Throughout the week, I'm, I'm going to try to present the diagnostics from a practitioner's point of view, okay? Engineers or physical chemists that want to use these diagnostics to understand physics. Now, that does not mean that we go blindly and apply them. There will be a great deal of theory uh, behind these diagnostics that I do want you to understand. That's really the only way that you can apply these things appropriately, okay? But we will stop the depth that we go at certain level, okay? So just understand, I really want you to be able to go and apply and understand turbulent combustion physics uh, with these diagnostics. And so that's, that's the viewpoint I'm, I'm taking, uh, treating these lectures. Okay, PIV. How many of you here use PIV? This has gotta be one of the more common ones, correct? Okay, you guys already know much about this technique. It's the most common method for measuring flow field properties. For those of you who don't use PIV, we're going to do the very general, but then we're going to go very in-depth in, uh, for, for three different, uh, two different lectures on PIV, okay? So first you see the flow of tracer particles, okay? So we're going to try, to try to infer, let's start at the very simplest version, we want to get the flow field velocity, okay? 
We're going to see the flow of tracer particles. They need to be small enough that they accurately follow the flow, but they need to be large enough so that they scatter light. And this will be kind of a compromise that we have to discuss. The flow is illuminated with two laser pulses. Okay, two laser pulses. They're they're in laser sheets. Okay, so you have two laser sheets, and they're separated by some time duration. One pulse, two pulse, back to back sequential pulses. Okay. They come in, they scatter light off of the tracer particles. We'll call it me scattered light for now. Me only refers to the me solution for spherical particles of the Lorenz me equations. Very rarely in combustion do we have spherical particles, so it's not really me scattering. So in all my newest slides, I've removed the word me and changed it to particle scattering, but you guys still have some legacy slides here, so we'll call it me scattering for now. Okay? So we're going to collect and we image them onto a dual frame camera. In the simplest experiment, it could go on the two cameras, it doesn't matter. The two exposures are bracketed around the two laser pulses. So again, we put particles in, two lasers come in, we take images of, those two, of the scattering from those two laser pulses. So here's an animation of it, two laser pulses. We generate uh, uh, particles, I'll go over each step. And then what we're going to do, here we go. Laser pulses go in. We acquire two particle images. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to divide them into interrogation boxes. Don't worry, we'll talk about every one of these things over and over again. So we essentially tessellate the image. Okay? We select subregions. We correlate the two images, and that gives us a vector. So the first thing you can say, I said correlate. PIV is a statistical measurement. There is no direct measurement, one of the gas velocity, you're measuring particle movement, and there is not even a direct interpretation of those particle movement, okay? So it is a statistical measurement that is subject to a lot of assumptions, okay? And that's why we'll, we'll, we'll speak about this for multiple lectures. And in lecture seven, of which you don't have in your book, at which, to which since you didn't have it at the time it was printed, I put bonus lecture on my slides, it's actually something about a new technique where we actually do do this directly for, for optical flow. I'm going to talk about a technique that we've been working on in my lab, which is actually pretty exciting. So, but right now, PIV. So right now, hopefully everybody understands the basic idea. We put particles, we track their movement, we infer the velocity, okay? And we get a velocity field. So again, the way that we get this is the gas phase velocity is determined from the motion of the tracer particles. There are a lot of potential problems with this. Again, we can't track the motion of individual particles. We can, but only for very sparse seeding, and there's problems with that. So what we do is we get more dense seeding like we have in PIV. We divide the images into coarse regions called interrogation windows. They're usually typically pretty large. Even the smallest ones are 16 by 16 pixels. So you're already thinking, well, does that mean I only get one vector every 16 by 16 pixels? Absolutely. You get one, uh, one vector, okay? So you can see there's going to be a spatial resolution problem with PIV. Okay? Uh, we correlate frame one and frame two. And in the, in the simplest way possible, the peak correlation between the two sets essentially gives you an average particle displacement between the two sets of images. Okay? And that is what we call the velocity vector of that region. Okay? So here's a lot what, what they end up looking like. Again, many of you have seen these. This is just a part of a vector field. You can get very nice vector fields. And where they really come into real utility is when we start combining these, and we'll talk a lot about this later, start combining this with scalar type measurements. And now you can actually look at the interaction maybe of the vector field, the velocity field, with the actual flame. This is from DLR, which is in a uh, model gas turbine, a swirl flame, and this is the OH PLIF measurement. And then it's a very nice, I always like looking at these images because this is a nice example. You can actually see the interaction of the velocity field kind of working with this precessing, uh, this flame that's kind of encapsulated within a precessing core, okay? Okay, so kind of if we had to summarize this, PIV uses scatters from tracer particles. So we would characterize this as a non-resonant technique. You can do it with any wavelength you would like. Uh, it's somewhat spatially resolved. Okay, it can be operated with a laser sheet or again as we move into say tomographic uh, imaging where we need a volume, uh, maybe a, a, what we'll call a thick laser sheet or a slab. Okay. Uh, you, again, we know the, the technique it uses two pulses of light and a dual frame camera. It's a linear technique, meaning that the signal scales with I even though this is not really important for PIV 
at all. Okay? Veloc here's the key, and I, I want this to really be what's percolating in the back of your mind. Velocity date is directly inferred. And there, the significant challenges come, especially in reacting flows with seeding and with correlation processing. And we'll, we'll talk about those. Laser-induced fluorescence. OK, so LIF is a common technique for probing or visualizing species concentration distributions. Okay. All right, the flow, again, this is, we'll already jump to chase. This is a resonant technique. So we have to tune a laser to a certain transition. So we have to tune the laser that overlaps an allowed electronic vibrational rotational transition. Depends on exactly what we want to look at in an atom or molecule. So here's an example of a lower, uh, the lower electronic state and the first, uh, sorry, the lower, essentially the ground state, the lower electronic state, the X state, and then the first uh, electronic state of OH, okay? And so if some of you have seen these potential curves, you have the X state and you have the A sigma state, okay? So this is the first excited state. Now, if I told you, hey, I want you to go make an OH spliff measurement just because I want some visualization. I just want to see the flame front. And you say to me, okay, where do I tune my laser? Well, you would go read in the literature, oh, if someone's doing the one zero band, for those of you who've done OH plif, I tune to 282 nanometers or whatever it is, you go read a paper and it tells you where to tune. Well, where does this come from? Well, if you want to excite uh, from essentially the ground state, again, to the one zero transition, and we'll go over the nomenclature in detail, okay? But this is essentially, we have vibrational rotational bands here. But let's just right now, we'll keep it very simple. We can go and actually on this potential energy figure out that, okay, looks there, I got about 35,000 wave numbers, okay? Of, and then if I convert that, that's 282 nanometers, okay? So the wavelength that you tune to is a direct product of the spacing, the, the energy spacing within a molecule, okay? And these things become, for diatomics, they're fairly straightforward as the molecule becomes more complicated. Uh, the spectroscopy and these potential energy curves become kind of complex for polyatomics. Okay, so the first thing that happens for fluorescence is the light is absorbed, okay? And we'll talk about absorption in detail, but really what that means is photons come in, you tune them to the right, uh, right line, and this actually, the molecule or the atom actually absorbs those photons, so it's taking on this excess energy, okay? So it's not happy anymore, right? It's not, it's not in its happy kind of equilibrium state. It's actually absorbed this energy. So it can hold on to it for a little bit, okay? It can, that means it can stay in the excited state, but eventually it has to get rid of this excess energy, okay? And, and the reason it can hold on to it, there's a natural lifetime of the excited state, uh, during this process, it'll redistribute all this energy, whatever specific vibrational rotational transition you tune to or absorb to, it'll eventually redistribute via vibrational energy transfer, rotational energy transfer. It'll redistribute all over the, the exci upper excited state, but at some point, those will start to decay down to the lowest level, and then it has to get rid of it, okay? It just can't hold on to that energy. And so it starts to fall back down. What can happen? Well, the majority is going to do this. I, I absorbed a certain amount of photons, okay? That's great. If, if all of that, I can use that useful, get that out of light, that's fantastic, but I can't do that. It's gonna run into molecules, so they take the energy. So what happens is this molecule in excited state has this excess energy, it runs into another molecule, it gives up that excess energy via collision. So we get nothing out of it, okay? But we get a little small fraction that will relax back down to the ground state or at least a lower energy state and during this process emit out a little photon or two, okay? And that's fluorescence, absorption and then re-emission of a photon, okay? And if we do that, we can actually look at light, okay? And this is proportional to a degree to the amount we absorb. So the light that you're getting out is proportional to the ground state population or the number density, okay? And again, we usually get something like 0.1%. That tells you the efficiency uh, of the process. Again, that's something called the quantum yield. And we'll talk about that during our fluorescence lecture. Okay. So lift can be performed at a single point line or with a laser sheet. If we're in imaging, okay, a, a camera is typically set up normal to the direction of the propagating sheet. This looks pretty standard. 
And then really kind of the main utility of laser-induced fluorescence uh, in turbulent combustion research is the visualization of structure. Here's a case that's the simultaneous OH and formaldehyde. So you can see the lower temperature region characterized by formaldehyde and the higher temperature regions characterized by OH. Again, a lot of times the emission is in the ultraviolet re regime, so then you have to go to intensified cameras, and again, your Im image quality suffers to some degree. Okay, so just quickly our review, because we only have about three minutes left before we're gonna take a break. Uh, PLIF allows detection typically of minor species. Uh, the selection is fairly limited. I said at the beginning you have a lot of selectivity, but in the scheme of things, it is rather limited. You have a few diatomics that are very well characterized that we typically look at and some atomic species. It can be spatially resolved. It's a resonant technique. Uh, single photon lift, meaning we just go to one transition, is linear, but multi-photon, which means we have to, we can't quite, let's say if we have to go to the vacuum UV, let's say the energy gap's just too, too great, we can send something about halfway there and then another photon can go and knock it into the actual uh, uh, transition. We'll talk about this. That's multi-photon LIF. It's non-linear technique uh, and signal goes way down. Okay. Predominantly a qualitative visualization technique but and we will spend a tremendous amount of time talking about quantification because it is difficult and there can be significant differences between the signal and the species. That's an important thing to think about. Okay. Scattering processes, okay? So we talked about fluorescence just quickly. Uh, there's a resonant processes that require the laser that's tuned. Scattering does not have this restric restriction. It's a non-resonant process, okay? Uh, again, we already talked about particle scattering, but what we're more interesting here is the scattering from gas phase molecules. So here's an image just took for fun in my lab with long exposure. You can't tell on the screen, but you can actually tell on the computer. You can see the ones that are really bright that from like dust in the room, but then you can actually, this stuff is actually just the actual gas phase uh, number density of the molecule. So that's what we're more interested in. We'll talk about two types of scattering process throughout these lectures. Again, elastic scattering and Rayleigh scattering, okay? And then Raman scattering. And we'll talk about all the different components for those of you. How many of you have done Raman scattering or are doing Raman? Did anybody do Raman? That's probably one of the rare ones. How about Rayleigh scattering? Anybody do Rayleigh scattering? All right, well, then you get to learn, learn a lot of new. Okay, so Raman scattering, we're, we'll spend time about the difference between rotational and vibrational, and it's actually coupling to Rayleigh scattering. So uh, we'll have several lectures on this, so that should be pretty interesting. Okay, uh, Rayleigh scattering is the quasi-electric scattering. Okay, from small particles. There's no net gain or loss of energy, so the scattering is at the same wavelength as the laser. Okay, Raman scattering is inelastic. We've already talked about this. So what happens is a photon actually goes to a sort of virtual state. It's not quite absorption, but there's energy gain or loss. And we'll talk about why that is. It couples to various vibrational rotational modes in the molecule. So what happens is, is the scattered light does not come back at the same wavelength, but it's shifted, okay? And whether or not if it, loses energy, it ends up shifting to redder wavelengths or lower frequencies, and if it gains energy, it ends up shifting to bluer wavelengths. These are Stokes and anti-Stokes. All of these aspects we'll talk about in detail, okay? So these are pretty weak. The thing that we should really know about Raman processes are typically about a thousand times less than Rayleigh scattering, which is about a thousand times less than particle scattering. So you can start to get the idea that these are very weak uh, processes that need very high power lasers. So there's only a few places in the world that do very good uh, Raman scattering measurements. You just need certain facilities, okay? In terms of Rayleigh scattering, we'll derive these throughout the lectures, but Rayleigh scattering is proportional to number density, okay? And that makes sense, scattering off the number of molecules, but it's not species specific, so this creates a problem. We do not know what gave rise to that signal. And so this will become a challenge in the interpretation of the signal, okay? If one knows the species present, let's say you either measure them with Raman scattering or you make an assumption, and we'll discuss both of those, then the number density can be measured, okay? The most common application in turbulent flames is a temperature measurement, okay? and we'll talk about how we get to this. We apply the ideal gas law 
P equals NKT. We make some assumptions about what we know and what we don't know, and we end up getting temperature. And here's examples from Sandia, very nice images of the temperature field. Okay? And then last bit, and we'll quit it for, for 15 minutes, is spontaneous, the Raman scattering. The equations look a lot the same, except that the exact wavelength shift of Raman scatter light is bond specific, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about this. And so that it becomes, since it's bond specific, when you have a species, a simple species mix, this actually becomes a species specific type of measurement. So with Raman scattering, we can end up writing that the signal that you measure is proportional to the number density of your species of interest. Now, you can imagine this is how it looks like versus Rayleigh scattering, you send the light in, you get essentially one spectra out. Okay? For Raman scattering, you get something that corresponds to all the different bonds. You have stuff that corresponds to a CH stretch, a CO stretch, a couple CO stretches, uh, OH stretches, uh, and then you have all these other species as well. Okay? And so that's what we end up getting with Raman scattering. We'll talk about how to collect and interpret the signal okay? because that's actually very different than any other diagnostic. So the most common application uh, is to determine major species in a turbulent flame. Here's an example from Sandia where you can see each one of these. It's a line measurement. The laser is put in on a line. So imagine the laser comes in like this. You collect the light and just flip it 90 degrees. That's what each one of these are. And then they're spectrally dispersed via spectrometer. Okay? So again, there's only one laser line but then all of the different species information is dispersed spectrally. And we'll, we'll spend a lot of time talking about how you actually interpret this. Okay, how do, you, how do you calibrate? How do you interpret when these things overlap? What about all this stuff in the middle? Okay, it's a very difficult measurement. Okay? But what you get out of this when done properly are the actual major species, carbon dioxide, water, H2CO. Keep in mind, it's complementary to fluorescence, which may only give you a single minor species. These give you the major species, okay? When you have the major species, you have the majority of the atomic composition, and you can determine the mixture fraction, okay? Which is, uh, tells you the rate, uh, state of mixing between, say, fuel and uh, air in a non premixed flame, okay? So the summary, you have it in your notes, but really, Rayleigh and Raman are non-resonant processes. They can be used with any source, but typically they're weak, so you need high-energy pulse lasers. Uh, you can detect them in many different ways. I, I will go over detection uh, in lecture uh, 13 and how you essentially how you want to calibrate your system, how you want to detect. Okay? The signals are linear. Uh, and again, as we work our way down, Rayleigh scattering is a measure of number density, but we don't know the species, so we have to make some assumptions if we want to turn Rayleigh scattering into something quantitative. Raman scattering can be quantitative. But it's kind of interesting, everything's temperature dependent. So what you find is that Raman and Rayleigh are usually jointly performed together. Okay? And again, as you can imagine, the interpretation is quite complex. Okay, so let's stop there for now. We're going to take our break. Uh, there's only a couple slides on cars, and then we'll move into lecture two, which is a shorter lecture. Okay? So I'm happy to take any questions now or during, during the break. Uh, and so normally we meet back at... 315, but let's take the full 15 minutes because the next lecture is a little shorter, or it should be, or I'll talk less, one of the two. So, all right, so 320, we'll start back again.